But today I'm pretty much here in my academic capacity, and the reason for that is that what I teach, and what I've been teaching now for 25 years, is comparative U.S. antitrust law and EU competition law. And it's in that guise that I actually do my work in U.S. law, because I've lived here for, lived in Britain for over 30 years. Well, the work I do in my day job is all European law, and I have a lot of colleagues in the U.S. who know a lot more about U.S. law, and when I have a question, I always ask them. So I'm always looking at this in terms of the comparative law perspective, and that's what I'm doing. And I would have worn my professor's hat, but it's too hot to wear a hat, so you'll just have to take my word for it that that's what I'm doing today. So this is the overview of what I'm going to talk about. You've had a number of people promise you that I'm going to tell you about Hatch-Waxman. I hope that you won't be disappointed. Uh, once I get through that, I want to give some of the background for, to the way that the FTC and the DOJ have seen the issue of reverse settlements over the uh, period, really since 2000, when the FTC first started making noises about this. And then go through some of the cases as they developed, which again were alluded to briefly in the previous presentation. Just to give you an idea of how it is that we got to where we are, where in June, finally, 13 years after the topic was first put on the table, the U.S. Supreme Court finally uh, addressed the issue of reverse settlements. This is a very important case, and the bulk of my presentation will be to start describing activists and its implications to you. And I'll conclude, because after all, I am wear, you know, wearing virtually my comparative law professor hat, with a couple of remarks about the way in which, about how the comparative law how this plays out from a comparative law perspective. And uh, I apologize in advance to the people who that will over, those comments will overlap with. <clears throat> so Hatch-Waxman. Okay. The reason it's called Hatch-Waxman is because the, original, the actual bill that became the Hatch-Waxman Act was introduced in Congress by Senator Hatch and Congressman Waxman back in 1964. And... Uh, and so, and it's traditional that we often take acts and call them by the people who introduced it. It's not some kind of a science fiction thing where you've got Waxman's being hatched. You know, I don't, you know. <laughs> okay, so at any rate, the whole point of, of Hatch Waxman is that this is a, a device for simplifying the process of bringing generic products to market. Uh, and it's meant, to, and it does this by providing incentives to the generics. And the key features of this is to make it easier to get the approval by the Federal Drug Administration for the new generic drug. And you do that by having what is a ANDA, which stands for an abbreviated new drug application. So a new drug application is what a pharmaceutical company has to bring to the FDA and show all of the, you know, that you've met the safety tests, that you've met the efficacy requirements, These are, and then you get it certified for use for certain treatments. Well, the thing about the abbreviated NDA is it's just like an NDA, but you don't have to prove any of that stuff. You can just piggyback on the, on the, on the NDA that the original uh, originator uh, producer put in. So obviously that saves a lot of time <laughs> and costs for a generics producer. It makes it easier. Now it then, but the interesting, the wrinkle on this is that they, they give you, that once you do the ANDA, if you're the first one, you have a 180 ex day exclusivity. So the first one to come on the market with this, with a generic drug, has half a year where there's no other generic producer. And that can be worth a lot of money to a generic producer, and so that by itself is an incentive. But the second part, and this is actually what plays out for the whole, the stuff we're talking about here, is that Hatch-Waxman has a tool for flushing out weak intellectual property, and that is the paragraph for certification. Now the point of the paragraph for certification is that the that the a, that you can go you can apply for an ANDA and certify that's the certification that your generic pro product does not infringe any patent or if it if it's alleged to infringe the patent that the patent is invalid and when you make that certification then the NDA holder that is to say the income the originator company that has claimed the patent, they have 45 days to file an infringement suit. And once the suit is filed, the FDA can grant 
can actually, you know, so you've made the ANDA, they can, they can actually grant the authorization under it 30 months later. And so this is the important part of the process. In other cases, you can go for years and years where the originator company says, oh, we think that you've infringed our patent. If, you're not, if you don't do something about it, we're going to bring a case. But they don't actually have to put their cards on the table. They don't actually have to go to court. And so now you have to go to court, and once you're in court, then the clock, the clock starts ticking. And, you know, and given the time that litigation takes, you have the situation where after a certain point, you can have that generics company ready to say, okay, the court case has gone on long enough, we're going to market, even though the court case hasn't yet been resolved. And so this is where we now get to create, this is what creates, at least in the mind of many, <clears throat> In the US context, this is what creates the reverse settlement phenomenon. We have the generics have incentives to go through, to, to, to start to push the button on this ANDA process. The costs are low, and it, the burden's on the originator to, get the, to, to, to start the legal action. And this then, and when, particularly as the clock starts ticking towards the point when the generic can actually enter, it creates an incentive for the originator company to get rid of the case. And if they get rid and if they've got a case where the generic company thinks that they've got a chance of succeeding, they may do it by making some kind of a payment. And so you have and the issue becomes and the effects become even more pronounced because of course if you think back to the beginning, the first generics company comes in and they file and they start the clock running. For the uh, and somebody else might do it, and even a third company would do it. But in the end, if everybody's settled out, anybody else who wants to come in, they've got 30 months that they have to wait before they can come in from the time that they filed their ANDA. And so, from the perspective of, of generics companies, you know, you don't sort of because it does, you know, once you start the process, you've actually got starting doing your work yourself to get ready. There is a the, whole, the way that the whole process works you know, means that once you've settled with a few people, there may not be anybody left in the pipeline to come in. You can actually, because of the way that Hatch-Maxman works. And the FTC maintains that this just doesn't happen in the, in the absence of the Hatch-Waxman kind of incentives. And so this leads, leads the FTC to uh, argue, starting in, in, as I say, in 2000 or so, that these reverse payments, the payments to the rival, to the generic, not to enter, is a classic antitrust violation. They say what is happening is that the monopoly profit that is enjoyed by the originator firm, again, I'm just using, stating what the FTC's case is, that the monopoly profit enjoyed by the originator firm is effectively being split with the generics firm because if the generic enters, the price goes down from 100 to 5, and the, so, the generic, so the originator producer has lost 95. The generics producer, on the other hand, is only getting the profit on the sale of 5. And so if they can get 50, they're better off. So by splitting, by having this reverse payment, you take the monopoly profit, split it, everybody's happy except, of course, according to the consumer. And this is because the benefits of early generic entry, the goal of the Hatch-Waxman Act, are lost. Now, initially, the focus was on payments. Payments is the most obvious case, but the FTC expanded <coughs> its analysis as it went on to broader commercial benefits because you would have cases where the originator would say, I'll make you my distributor, I'll give you money for that, or I will make you, or I will, you know, and more recently, I will make you the authorized generic, so you can do it, but nobody else can, this kind of thing. Now, the way that the FTC does it, they can apply Section 5 of the FTC Act, which is the provision of that act which prohibits unfair trade practices. That provision is also interpreted to include all violations of the antitrust law. And when they use Section 5, they can apply both restrictive agreement, what would normally be Section 1 of the Sherman Act, and monopolization, uh, what would normally be Section 2 of the Sherman Act theories. Now, DOJ also got into the Act. This is the way it works in the US. And up until 2008, they took a somewhat different view. They said, well, we can see that reverse settlements are bad, but we also know that settlements can be good. 
And what we think is that there should be a rule of reason approach. And the DOJ, the DOJ didn't actually bring any cases because you know, in the second Bush administration, DOJ just didn't bring any cases. <laughs> but uh, they did, but they said that if they ever did a, a case, they would be relying the most important factors in the rule of reason analysis was this, would be the strength and the scope of the patent. Now, once 2009 came, we had you know, a new set of uh, wise people in the DOJ, and they decided actually that the way that the FTC was doing it made sense, and having a single US government position made sense. And so the DOJ formally now endorses the FTC position. This then brings us to the cases. And there were, and what happened is that the FTC started bringing these cases, and the FTC didn't do very well in these cases. The first big case, was uh, sharing plow uh, and in the 11th Circuit. And this is where we first have this phrase that was referred to in the previous presentation, which is the reliance on the scope of the patent. And so what this means is that if you don't have, a, you know, putting aside cases where the patent has been obtained by fraud, which is dealt with by a whole different set of precedents, or a uh, cases where the patent is objectively baseless, which is the sham litigation exception, again, a whole another line of, of uh, cases. You're not, going, you're, you're not going to allow the application of antitrust law to a patent settlement where the settlement is within the scope of the patent. So it's settling you know, the, claim, the claims that are settled and the relief which is, uh, and which is given as all part of what is within the claim set out in a patent which has been issued and approved by the patent office. And this is applying a presumption which exists in U.S. patent law, which is the presumption of validity, you know, that the patent is presumed to be valid until it has been found to be invalid through the judicial process. And, uh, and this was followed by a number of the other circuits until we get to 2012, when in another case, which is KDUR antitrust litigation, the uh, Third Circuit found that, the, that in fact, there, you know, that, 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 that there was a, uh, a claim under the antitrust laws for, you know, against reverse settlements. And they indeed took on the uh, approach that advocated by the FTC, which I'll describe in a minute, which was that these Act, that these agreements should be presumptively invalid. This set the stage for the case of FTC versus activists. Okay, so it's worth just going a little bit into what happened in this case below because it helps to understand a bit of, we get more granularity about what goes on in these kind of cases. You know, this involved litigation between Solvay, which of course is a Belgian company, and two generic producers called Paddock and Watson. And just to make it comp and Watson is now activist, which is how activist becomes the name of the case, which is on appeal. On appeal. Now, this litigation involved a follow-on patent covering a, a, a synthesized testosterone product, and the uh, so the patent was issued in 2003. There was an ANDA application and. You know, in 2000, you know, in later in 2003, granted in 2006. And they were heading for entry in 2007. And according to the papers, Solvay anticipated that if, this, if they lost, at the point that these generics came in, their sales would go down by 90%. They would lose $125 million annually. So this is, again, the kind of uh, cost, to, you know, this informs the reason that the uh, originator company is willing to space so much money to save some part of that. And another thing, which is when you look at what's on the board here to consider, it's not unusual for these cases to involve follow-ons. This was not the original innovation by Solvay. <coughs> this was the uh, sort of the additional sort of the evergreening patents that they came up with. And those are much more ripe to challenge usually, either for validity or for infringement purposes. So we now go to the, so the settlement terms were that they delayed the entry for four years. They would make annual payments, $30, you know, 19 to $30 million a year to Watson. Uh, and this is, the FTC says, ostensibly because Watson was going to do marketing for Solvay. 
Paddock would get two million a year to serve as a backup supplier, and Parr would get 10 million for marketing purposes. And so this raises one of the other issues. Are these actually legitimate, you know, these activities that Watson, Paddock, and Parr were going to be doing for Solvay? That, of course, is not addressed in the activist judgment. So we then go to, and so this then gets litigated because the FTC brings an action, and they bring it in California because the Ninth Circuit hasn't ruled on this. But due to the way that, our, uh, that in the US the multi-district litigation panel operates, this case was transferred to Georgia, which is part of the Eleventh Circuit, which of course is the circuit where sharing plow had been decided six years before. Bad news for the FTC. And so the FTC should have changed their arguments around a bit, and they pleaded in Georgia that there was evidence that showed that Solvay knew that they had less than a 50% chance of success. This was a weak patent. And this distinguished it from uh, sharing plow. And the, uh, but the district court still dismissed. They said, we're in the 11th Circuit. Uh, we have a scope of the patent rule, actually, since they're in Georgia. So I said, you know, you all, you know, we're in the, eight, we're in the 11th Circuit. <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, it would have taken longer. I apologize for that. Uh, and the Court of Appeals, the 11th Circuit, affirmed. And, they have, and they, one of the reasons that they, re they rejected this argument about the weakness of the patent, because they said, it's not appropriate, really, for a, US, a district court in an antitrust case to be trying the validity of patent issues. You know, that's, we have a whole different set of courts to do it. And this is what they describe as the Turducken problem. And I'll come back and explain that in a few minutes. OK, so this brings us to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court grants a writ of certiorari uh, to resolve the dispute between the 11th Circuit and the 3rd Circuit and other circuits on this issue of reverse settlements. And in a 5-3 decision, uh, they reverse the Court of Appeals and uh, with a, in a majority opinion by Justice Breyer. And I mentioned that in a, just in passing, that of course, for those of you who don't know, Justice Breyer is probably the, emin the most eminent antitrust scholar among the sitting judges of the US Supreme Court, former professor of antitrust law at Harvard Law School. And uh, so can normally be trusted to at least get the antitrust doctrine right, if not you know, the, the IP side of the, of the uh, of the reckoning. And so what they, what, he do, what they do is they reject the scope of the patent rule, which was relied upon in, in Shearing Plow. They say that the court must resolve I, the IP antitrust law conflict by balancing the privileges granted to the patentee against traditional antitrust interests, so a balancing test. And this is a quote from the judgment, which I think is very telling whether a particular restraint lies beyond the limits of the patent monopoly is a conclusion that flows from that analysis and not as the Chief Justice, who dissented, by the way, suggests its starting point. And, but, so, the, and so the court re overturns the, uh, the Court of Appeals, it, it overturns the scope of the patent rule, but it also overturns the test which the FTC proposed. Because as I mentioned a moment ago, the FTC wanted to say that these kind of cases should be presumptively unlawful. In other words, once you show that there is a reverse settlement, then, they, uh, then it ought, the burden ought to be on the, on the parties to provide affirmative justifications. In the absence of that, it should be unlawful. This is the so-called quick look approach. And so instead of the quick look approach, the court endorsed a rule of reason approach. Now, in endorsing the rule of reason approach, the court has a very interesting pas passage in the judgment where they go through the antitrust policy interests that favor intervention. And the first of these is that they conclude that reverse settlement payments have a, general, have, a, have a genuine potential for adverse effects on competition. And, and I've sort of or, reorganized a little bit the way that they present it, but this is a summary of the way that they argue it. First of all, the incumbents usually have substantial market power, which has been granted by the patent, but which is allowing them to charge 
you know, very high prices, which they wouldn't be able to charge if the patent were found to be invalid. The, and this that leads to the second point, which is if a challenge to the patent were successful, then consumers would benefit through lower prices. And then pointing to the specificities of Hatch-Waxman, which I described to you at the beginning, the, it's not necessarily likely that, a, that once one uh, generic has settled or a sec and a second generic has settled, you know, once the people in the pipeline have settled, you've got a 30-month <coughs> period before anybody else can come up and take a whack. And that means that you can't conclude that there are unlimited people who could come in and then you know, be able to you know, uh, introduce their own generic product and therefore get to these benefits. And then they go through, then they, the second point is that these consequences, you know, they might be justified sometimes. And the reason that they could be justified would be where you have a bona fide settlement you know, where you had traditional settlement <coughs> considerations, you know, such as you know, the uh, paying somebody if you know, their costs of litigation, because nobody wants to stop a lawsuit and be out of pocket. If you leave them in the point where at least they say, okay, I will pay for your lawyer's costs you, if you go away, then th in theory at least you're leaving them back where they started. But without those kind of costs, without some other you know, benefit that you could show, you know, then there will be a lot of cases where that justification won't be there. And then they make the third point where they really deal with the Turducken point, and I will get back to the Turducken point in a second, but they deal with the Turducken point by saying that it's not necessary to, it's usually not necessary to litigate the you know, whether the patent has been valid or infringed. There are other ways of dealing with that. And finally, they say that this doesn't end settlements because you can still have settlements of these kinds of disputes. You just can't do it by paying you know, big uh, truckloads of money. And the example that they give, you can have a settlement where it says, okay, uh, you say that you want, you know, with your ANDA, you could enter on Tuesday. Uh, we, will set, you know, we will settle it and I'll agree that you, know, you can enter in two years and that still gives you five years before the patent would actually have expired normally. And so we're sort of you know, we're splitting the difference in some way between you know, the 10 year period of exclusivity and the five year period of exclusivity. Now the, um, they go through, so they go through this, as I say, the, you know, they've rejected the quick look approach which was advocated by the FTC. And they've rejected it by pointing to the basic law that the court has applied and saying, when is a quick look appropriate? And I've put the quote on the board, but it's basically where observers with even a rudimentary understanding of economics could conclude that the arrangement in question would have an anti-competitive effect on customers and markets. Some people would say that they're talking about the average judge. <laughs> but that is the, uh, but applying that criteria, they can say, no, this, is, it's, this isn't that simple. Because whether you have anti-competitive effects depends on the size of the payment, the relationship of the payment amount to future litigation costs, the relation of the payment amount to other services that it, for which it might re represent payment, or, and this is a quote from the judgment, lack of any other convincing justification. And so in answering the question of the quick look, they actually give the criteria which they think are important for applying the rule of reason. Now, the key role here is played by the size of the payment. And it's interesting here because, you know, and this go deals with what was a central argument, a central issue, I should say, in the oral argument of this case before the court. Because they had the, a, a lot of the judges, including the judges who ended up dissenting, uh, were concerned, and Justice Breyer was concerned in his questioning during the oral argument about how can we have one of these cases and you know, resolve a rule of reason without having a mechanism for assessing whether the patent is strong or weak. And remember that the DOJ, back before 2009, their proposed rule of reason focused on whether the patent was strong or weak. 
And this is important because from an economic perspective, the existence or extent of the competitive harm depends on the strength of the patent. But how is an antitrust, you know, but how can a antitrust court do that? And this is what I've been getting to. This is the Turducken problem. And this is what the 11th Circuit called it. Now, for those of you who aren't versed in American culture, a turducken is a special dish that you can produce at th cook at Thanksgiving, which is a turkey, which is cooked with a duck inside and with a chicken inside the duck. <laughs> okay, a turducken. And the reason that this is the turducken problem is that you have an antitrust action with a patent action inside. Get it? <laughs> And so the court says, we don't have to worry about the turduck problem because apparently they're all vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> no, their result resolution is that the problem can be avoided simply by looking at the size of the reverse payment. In a word, and this is a quote from the court, the size of the unexplained reverse payment can provide a workable surrogate for the patent's weakness, all without forcing a court to conduct a detailed exploration of the validity of the patent itself. And so this now leads to, you know, so this is the judgment. It leads us to a lot of unresolved issues. And there have been already, you know, there are you know, dozens of academics have been, have been charging forward with their, uh, the thoughts that they want to give about this, uh, about this case. And I'll just go through a few of them now. Okay, first just a comment. And that is the, the lack of specificity in the rule of reason case in activism isn't surprising because remember, nobody before the court was arguing for a rule of reason. You had the, uh, the government, the Solicitor General arguing for the FTC, and he's there saying, what we think that you need to have is a presumption of illegality. Quick look, that's all it is, no rule of reason. And then you have the defendants, or, and they're saying, no, this, that's crazy. What you need to have is presumptive validity. It's going to be scope of the patent, and that's the only way to do it. Nobody was arguing for the rule of reason. And so the court was a bit sort of uh, challenged in coming up with a detailed approach for what the rule of reason should look at. And so, what are the issues? And so this leaves a lot of issues in open. First of all, you know, what does a patent need to prove? You know, is it simple? For, is, the gov is it sufficient for the government or for a private plaintiff just to show that the pa the the payment is big, does that shift the burden of proof to provide justification? And if that's the case, as a number of, of uh, commentators have said, isn't that just having the uh, presumptive of, invalidity, of illegality by another name? And most people seem to think, no, it can't mean that, including you know, a, commis a commissioner from the FTC speaking recently, no, it can't mean that. Uh, but what it means is an open question. And, when, it, when is a payment large? You know, is the only criteria, as again, some of the commentators have suggested to say, the payment is large as soon as it exceeds litigation costs? Is it possible to have some other benchmark for saying what a large payment uh, is? And if so, what would that be? Uh, one criteria which featured very much in the discussions before the court and was the, the possibility that maybe a payment is really suspect if it exceeds the profit that a generic would make if its entry was successful. Remember, as I explained, when the generic enters, the uh, profit, the overall you know, quote, you know, the uh, sales price goes down by 90%. And so that the profit that the generic makes is you know, that whatever profit they make on their sales at 10% of the original price, whereas the monopoly profit is 90% of that. And so, the, uh, and so you could see that a payment would simply put the generic in the position where they would have been in if they had successfully entered. It may still be objectionable, but it does not involve sharing the monopoly profit, which is the biggest, one of the biggest objections that you would see also in the text of the judgment. The, uh, then you get the question of when are payments permissible, and I'm on the uh, The uh, Because you get, you, know, you get to this question of when you're paying for other things or when you're giving things in kind, you know, does it matter if it's within the scope of the original patent or not? Does it matter if it's something which the, patentee, which the generic might have gotten in successful litigation? 
Well, the FTC says that it does. You know, there's an argument that it doesn't. And then you get to the question of other economic justifications. And there's a huge set of literature here, which you know, I don't you know, even pretend to want you know, to have time to get into now. But two arguments which come up a lot is, suppose that you can show that the payment actually facilitated entry by the generic earlier than it otherwise would have occurred. And there's a whole economic theory, a sort of game theory, whatever, that says how that could happen. You know, would that, if you can prove that, would that be a justification? There's also the issue of what if you have a generic who, if they went through the litigation, would, and if they lost, they would have been insolvent, so that the uh, originator co company would not have been able to recover back you know, from them their costs if they had entered successfully, you know, ruined the business of the originator, and then had actually lost the patent litigation. Uh, can you have a payment which is sort of a form of insurance to provide for that loss if you're dealing with a company which is in difficulty? And then finally, you have the issue, is the strength of the patent entirely off the table? The court is very careful in the judgment. They said usually, normally, it's not necessarily. Yes, the size of the payment is a surrogate, but maybe you can bring it in by the back door. Uh, the, issue that make that you know it's been suggested that in some cases the generic as well as the originator want to come in and talk about the weakness or the strength of the patent in order to make some of the economic arguments that I mentioned earlier make sense. And so the final point is to just is to uh, the final point is just to talk about the implications for the EU debate. And here, my, fine, my major point is just to say that caution is in order. As a number of people have said, and which is clearly correct, the Hatch-Waxman regulatory structure is the essential context for looking at activists. And uh, it's not clear at all that you would have had a majority in the Supreme Court for Breyer's judgment, for, for Breyer's opinion, if you didn't have Hatch-Waxman behind it. Uh, and then the other point, of course, is to remember that when we're looking at the US, the problem of IP antitrust conflicts is relativized because the IP statutes and the antitrust statutes are all federal statutes. The Supreme Court gets to decide all of them. And if they decide, well, we're going to use antitrust this week and IP next week, you know, it sort of doesn't matter because it is a whole unified system of law. And you know, different issues are, you know, are raised, I think, if you have community law on the one side, or Europe, if union law, I should say, on the one side, and, na and national law of IP on the other. And then the whole point about why they've decided to do this as a rule of reason or a quick look. You know, this is a, an issue which in US law has its own history. It's very complicated. And I wouldn't want to start <coughs> equating it to the issue of object versus effect in EU law. So thank you. <coughs>